Okay, we start this section on the Asian subcontinent, and uh, it's often referred to as the Indian subcontinent. Feel free to refer to it uh, depending on your sense of subcontinental nationalism in any case. And like I do with each new section, let me first uh, give some basic generalities about the physical environment. I'll pick and choose like I always do because I'll ask you primarily those questions. Not uniquely those questions, but primarily those. And they'll intersect with the text, of course. First off, as you can see here, all right, this piece of land here, as uh, you can see by where the cursor is, right about over here, is the what will become the Indian subcontinent. And as you can see progressively uh, from 225 million years ago right through uh, 135 million years ago, Jurassic period, 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs essentially went extinct, you can see that it is breaking off as a function of plate tectonics, which you're familiar with, all right, and presently is in the configuration that you see today. It has migrated, if we wish to use that word, to the north. It has impacted into the southern flank of Asia, and you can see it here, which we now refer to as the Indian subcontinent. You can see the implications for that when we look at this image here where you can see the Asian subcontinent here has impacted into the southern flank of Asia pushing up this impressive, in fact the planet's most impressive mountain range, those are the Himalayan mountains and of course behind the Himalayan mountains you have the Tibetan Plateau. You can understand why the Asian subcontinent is considered a separate section or a separate region. Geography is sort of mandated it is so. The subcontinent is separated by physical features, if you would. You have the Himalayan mountains to the north. You have the extensive desert regions that run into the Middle East, far and other deserts running into the Middle East, separating it, if you would, from the Middle East. And of course, to the east, you have low-lying, dense tropical rainforests, which are uh, quite frankly, still an impediment to uh, traffic to this very day. And uh, so that you can understand why the uh, Indian subcontinent has often been referred to, if you would, uh, as a, a fortress of sorts on a continental scale. And you can see why it's a separate region in any case. Now, it's, a, it's a, often referred to as a topographical fortress. Okay. There has been numerous groups which have invaded, if we wish to use that word, usually the word should be migrated, but we'll look back with our long distance perspective and uh, uh, can see it as sort of a, an invasion, usually a, a cultural invasion. There have been numerous groups who have come into the subcontinent, um, usually coming through the northwest over what you would now consider Afghanistan through Pakistan. Numerous groups have, have entered, Persians, Afghans, Turks, Greeks, and others. But there's one group you want to specifically take note of, because you're going to get asked about it, and this group has left the most definitive imprint, culturally speaking, on the Indian subcontinent that you can see today. All right? You can see the isolation of these different groups, which I talked about here. or isolation of the region, I should say. The, the uh, uh, entry into the subcontinent that is most important, as you can see here, is often referred to as the Aryan invasion, roughly speaking, taking place somewhere between 3500 uh, BCE and 2000 BCE. And it's the Aryans that have left the most definitive imprint on the Asian subcontinent. As you can see, the principal indicator of cultural difference or of culture is language. It's not the only one, but it's the principal one. And the Aryan spoke what we now refer to as an Indo-European language. In fact, that language is referred to as Sanskrit. And what you find is that many of the myriad languages that are spoken on the Indian subcontinent stem from this initial language brought by the Aryans so long ago. Much like in Western Europe, 
many of the, the, the Romance languages, if you were, all stem from Latin, which was spoken by the Roman Empire. So French, and Italian, uh, and Spanish, and Portuguese. In any case. Now, the Aryans, as you can see by this image here, pushed down preceding groups that were in the subcontinent when they came in, all right, making one of many cultural divisions that you can see in India today, but uh, certainly a, a large enough scale one that we'll talk about it in this class. You have the Indo-European language speakers, which dominate most of the core of the subcontinent, but the remnants of preceding groups are often speak a, speak a set of languages which are often referred to collectively as Dravidian. And the Dravidian speakers have been pressed down into the southern tip of the subcontinent. That is one cultural division that lasts to this day. It's not simply a matter of language as a vast statistical average. I say a statistical average, not an absolute definitive trait. You tend to find Dravidian speakers tend to be of a darker complexion, Aryans of a lighter complexion. I do say as a vast statistical measure, in any case. The predominant religion in the subcontinent today is Hinduism. And Hinduism stems from the belief of the Aryans. Hinduism, as you can see indicated by this graphic, is a polytheistic religion. Polytheistic religion, you can see, as is defined there, is a religion that recognizes multiple gods. All right, And as I put on there, that's as opposed to monotheistic religions that recognize only one god. I've given you some more of the high-profile examples of uh, Hindu gods that you can see there. Each one of these gods tend to represent certain talents and traits, certain mandates in the natural world, if you would, nevertheless. Now, this is not a class on religion, but uh, it is important to take note that Hinduism rests on the belief of reincarnation. One will be reincarnated and take physical form in the contemporary world based upon the deeds in a previous life, in any case. You can see that sort of indicated here, where the notion that the soul is reborn in flesh again and again and again is part of a long process of achieving perfection and with the ultimate objective of rejoining the Creator, in any case. Now, there's a feature of Hinduism that you want to take note of, especially since most, not all, most of, uh, of Westerners are coming from either uh, membership in a monotheistic religion, or you're familiar with it if you're not formally a member. And a way of discriminating Hinduism, amongst many ways, but a way of discriminating Hinduism against the Western monotheisms is that Hinduism, unlike, say, Christianity, believes there is more than one path to God. In other words, there is no orthodoxy. In other words, there are many acceptable ways to practice the religion. You are not scorned and condemned for different ritual practices to the same degree as other major religions. And you might take that to be a rather progressive point. Don't be so rapid to do so. These things are rather sophisticated. All right. Let me show you one of the features of Hinduism, uh, or I should say one of the features of, say, Indian society, which is accommodated by Hinduism, and that is Hinduism has a caste system. In fact, I should say, technically, India has a caste system. It is accommodated by Hinduism. I'll leave it to theologians to flesh out whether that's fundamentally part of the religion or not. Uh, it's an interesting discussion. I'll save for another day. You need to know the Indian caste system. 
It is often, by the way, referred to as the Varna, as I've seen here, as you can see here. Now, these castes, what a ca the caste system is, is a steep socioeconomic hierarchy. All right? There's little social mobility between this socioeconomic hierarchy. And these castes, by the way, you are born into. That's what it means when you don't have social mobility. You're born into your caste. Now, there are, an, in actuality, thousands of castes. They tend to break down by your livelihood, all right, your economic livelihood. But, of course, we cannot do thousands of different castes in here. We're going to have to simplify the caste system. And you can see a simplification of that caste system here, or, or the Varna here. At the top of this socioeconomic hierarchy are Brahmins. These were historically priests and administrators. And each one of these castes, by the way, have different rituals in their attempt to preserve and enhance their caste identity. They would say their purity or their degree of purity. All right. In fact, technically, Brahmins are supposed to be not even touched by lower castes. So pure are Brahmins at the top of the caste system. As you can see, next in line are the warrior caste. As you can see, I will not try to pronounce that properly. I'll end up distorting it. And you can see their historical role was that of the aristocracy, shall we say, the protectors, if you would. I say protectors, all right. You might be taking note that this system looks something like the European feudal system, where you would have had a monarch at the top, usually with the affirmation and sanction of the divine, as expressed by the Catholic Church. Let's not go into too much details there. But behind, uh, uh, they would have provided military services. Those were the knights. All right, the warrior caste. And of course, just like in Western feudalism, you would have found the urban merchant class beneath them. So too, you can see in the Indian caste system here. All right, the merchant caste is third. And then fourthly, you can see the fourth caste is the uh, shudra, which are primarily agricultural labors. And if you were a study of European feudalism, you would have called them serfs in Europe. So in other words, you have the basic caste system, as you can see here, descending in line, uh, if you would, uh, in terms of perceived uh, level of spiritual purity of a sort, in any case. Okay, this caste system that you can see here represents approximately 80% of the population in India, roughly speaking, give or take. But there's 20% in the caste system that is not shown. Excuse me, they are not in the caste system. They are not shown. And you can see them here, as I've indicated on this graphic. These are the untouchables. They represent about, roughly speaking, 20% of the population. The untouchables are often referred to as the Dalits. And as you can see, and I've written there, they're considered the most unpure. They perform menial jobs linked to unclean things. They are largely, although not uniquely, comprised of the descendants of indigenous populations, Dravidian speakers, if you would, when Aryans arrived. Again, that's an imperfect relationship. You might go ahead and use the word outcasts. They are the bottom of the system, if you would. All right. So you have a steep socioeconomic hierarchy with unpleasant and menial jobs being increasingly done by the lower ranks, especially the untouchables. That is sort of indicated here, all right, where jobs that have to do with unpure things are reserved for those lower castes, in any case. And you get photographs like this. This is Jodhpur. Uh, which is often referred to the Blue City. This particular color is associated with the Brahmins, if you would. Some of you might think, well, it's a steep socioeconomic hierarchy. Surely one can advance 
through personal relationships, especially through marriage. Now, you think that over as a particularly Western perspective. When you get married in the subcontinent, the family plays a very important role, and the family is not going to approve. In fact, a lot of marriages are arranged. The family is not going to approve of you, whatever caste you are, marrying somebody from a lower rank. And thus, that is not necessarily a mechanism for advancement in any case. This caste system is problematic and for a modern India. Problematic because if you want to participate in the world economy, you need to upgrade the skills of as much of your population as possible so as to participate with other economies. And if you've got at least 20%, and arguably much greater than that, of course, the lower castes, not receiving uh, the benefits of uh, collective taxation, certainly in terms of education, you are hindering your country's advancement potential. The United States realized this in the middle of the 20th century, certainly during the Civil Rights Movement, where, of course, the United States had a racial caste system and formalized opportunity and privilege uh, based on skin color. And it realized that this was not workable in the modern world economy. It's a problem. India still has this system in place. It is problematic. In fact, when the federal go uh, government proposed in, the, in 1990 an affirmative action program to make sure that a substantial percentage, I believe it was something like only 25 to 50 percent of government sector employment, which is huge in India, all right, they, they wanted to reserve that for the untouchable caste. There were, uh, uh, there were mass demonstrations by higher castes against it the very thought of empowering this, shall we say, discriminated against caste with these type of opportunities was offensive, uh, especially to, uh, say, a population that had historically been essentially slaves, in any case. In fact, Gandhi, who I referred to, I referenced to when I was talking about South Africa in the last section, Gandhi was killed by a Hindu outraged at Gandhi's desire to help the poor, which meant the threatening of the ancient caste system. That gave so much shape to Indian life. The very thought that somebody was going to come along and overturn this established social order was extremely offensive to some. So Gandhi wasn't assassinated by some agent of India which had dominated uh, the country up until 1947. He was assassinated by a domestic, not unlike Martin Luther King being assassinated uh, in the United States uh, by interests ultimately offended by his attempt to democratize opportunity in the United States and get rid of the racial caste system. Such people are incredibly offensive to those who are status quo privileged. Those of you who are Christians understand this. Some would say Jesus Christ was also assassinated, if you would, in a sense, very dramatically, all right, for overturning a social order. Not quite analogous to this circumstance, but you get the picture. In any case, it will not surprise you that, not unlike other portions of the world, Christianity is growing in India, and if I was to ask you on a test, which group within India do you think that Christianity is, is being adopted disproportionately, it's by the untouchables, which is entirely understandable if you are discriminated against a population with little opportunity, all right, and that discrimination is in fact codified by the theological system, and certainly many of the political provincial systems in the country, you can understand how people may would say, hey, look, let's try a new system or a, a new context that, that at least recognizes my individuality and uh, uh, will give me a new shuffle, uh, a, a new deal of the cards. You might understand why Christianity is spreading, is spreading amongst that population. Okay? So that's the Indian caste system. You need to know it.